Hi, everyone. Uh, we'd like to uh, thank you for showing up at this early hour, 8 a.m. Um, the first question you might have is, when, where's the coffee? And the coffee will be arriving at 10 a.m. So I hope you can survive that long. Uh, this is uh, an IEEE meeting um, run by the IEEE Brain community uh, and co-sponsored by um, several people and several entities, excuse me, uh, the Solid State Circuit Society within the IEEE, uh, EMBS, uh, and a lot of work from the people here at UC San Diego. Um, the IEEE is the world's largest engineering society. For those of you who may be neuroscientists and not familiar with the IEEE, and uh, you know, science is great. I'm a scientist, but you know, at some point, if you want to deploy things in the real world, you need engineers, and that is the IEEE's job. So the IEEE brain community uh, organizes the uh, IEEE cats that are in charge of neuroscience research and tries to unite them and uh, provide a common. Uh, place for everybody in the IEEE who works on brain or brain related things to uh, to sort of mingle and, and communicate. And uh, every two years we have a meeting in association with the Society for Neuroscience. So that's why we're having the meeting here. Um, I, can I just take a quick poll? I know it's still early and our room is still sparse, but how many people here are uh, like actually here for the SFN meeting? Ah, so a bunch. So it actually kind of worked. That's great. Really, you were the, the SFN audience was exactly who we were targeting having the meeting here. So thank you so much for showing up. Um, I'm going to make this uh, quick because we have a very full schedule. We have a lot of great speakers at this meeting. And uh, I'll probably be back to talk about the IEEE brain community later. But for now, I will uh, pass this on to our local organizers and to the organizer of the first session. So Virgo, so next we have uh, Matten, who will be um, representing an uh, Indias. Can you hear me without microphone? Okay. I did not prepare PowerPoint. And the session is of my degree in medicine and biology for five years. And we are delighted to be uh, sponsors of this event, ITRP initiated with other ITRP societies. Uh, just a uh, brief, the uh, summary about the society. We are the largest and oldest biomedical engineering society in the world. Actually, last two years, we really revolutionized the society. We had an amazing meeting in Israel with 28 keynote speaker on data science and healthcare. We are going to have the first data science and <laughs> healthcare special public conference in Malta, and we are going to be in Sub Sahara. And it's going to be with World Health Organization joining us global healthcare. Of course, the brain is very, very important. But for this meeting, I would like to really acknowledge the harbor by Gert, Jack, uh, Ricky, uh, Cynthia, somewhere, I think she's behind. They did all the hard work, hard work and I'm just speaking here. For the, when it comes to this the event, actually, we started with advanced technologies for brain initiative as a part of my to brain. Uh, Jacob was questioning what happened to that one. It's actually morphed that one from technology to morph, turn into integrate with medicine and the biology more. And also we get the clinical people and the industry people and more students involved with our conferences. So we translated it more cognitive, minimal and non-invasive, and also the build a, a harmony between brain, mind, and body. Two things critical for all IEEE, we must have more clinical people attending our conference. We must have clinical people attending our conferences. <coughs> students, I think this is an incredible role model. In fact, in Israel, 14 of them were CEOs from data science. Delighted to be here. Thank you so much. And next time, don't give the microphone. I love microphone. If I have it, I talk too much. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome everyone. My name is Ricky Muller. I'm a professor of electrical engineering and computer science at UC Berkeley. And today I'm representing the Solid State Circuit Society or SSCS. I'd like to begin by thanking SSCS, Solid State Circuits Directions and Women in Circuits for their support in making this workshop possible. I'd, uh, and I'd like to especially thank our speakers, panelists and poster presenters for joining us in person. I know some of you have traveled very far. 
Um, this year, Solid State Circuits is co-sponsoring this workshop for the first time. It is in fact, the first brain specific meeting to my knowledge that SSCS has sponsored, uh, but it's far from a new topic in solid state circuits. It was the invention of the bipolar transistor in 1947 and a repurposing of a metronome circuit that enabled the development of the implantable pacemaker. Integrated circuits have been driving um, development of neurotechnology ever since. Today, we can leverage 75 years of advancements in circuits to enable devices that can record from thousands of neurons, have wireless capabilities, perform highly complex computations on device, and allow us to shrink entire neural simulators to near invisible form factors. Over the next two days, we will hear, um, we will hear talks about some of these latest advancements in the field. Um, bringing together experts in technology development, computation, and clinical impact. I hope you're all as excited as I am to be here together to observe and experience the evolution of neurotechnology and its impact on humanity. So with that, I will open up the, uh, our first mini symposium, or do you have... Thanks, Ricky. And I just mentioned, Ricky was also one of our first... Uh... Speakers, right? First speaker, the first uh, conference, which was held here, it was three years, so three years ago here, the same venue, uh, met and also by Mr. Mamzit. So, he, oh, he was freezing. Uh, hopefully, he won't be freezing today. <laughs> yeah, so, so this workshop is now three years old. Uh, we have had, this is now the third one, uh, of our first one. So, Metan and Shankar uh, spearheaded it together. So, we had, uh, and us with uh, Bruce Wheeler. Um, and um, was here, um, sponsored by uh, EMBS. Um, and so I Dream Brain has been a co-sponsor from the very beginning, from the first uh, meeting. Um, and so is also the issue for neurocomputation. So welcome, in addition to welcome to this meeting and uh, I can present in fact all the societies, I'm a member of all of them. Um, uh, but also here we have the Institute for Neurocomputation, it's right there next door. Uh, in fact, the, the demonstrations will be inside the Mobi lab, which is the um, mobile brain imaging lab. And so we'll have some real exciting live mobile things happening here because uh, it's part of the, this conference. And this has been a feature of this conference or this workshop, this symposium from the very beginning. We envisioned this as something very different from a traditional conference or a meeting. All right, we're um, sure we have posters, but they're actually interactive posters. And more than that, we have also done these demonstrations where uh, we'll have students that will actually showcase their work. Actually, they, they brought it here. And uh, right, it will be live, real time. And so you can interact with it and you can take it apart if you want or um, uh, test it to its limits if, if you want. Uh, it could be nice to the students because they worked hard on it, but uh, you can definitely uh, uh, put it at the test, right? Uh, so, and that, and also this meeting um, fills in a way a void. Um, sure, there are plenty of meetings on neuroscience, systems neuroscience, computational neuroscience. There are great meetings on on um, bioengineering, right? Or, or uh, right? So, my biological systems. Um, there are even meetings on neuroengineering, um, and there are other meetings on cognitive science, AI, right? So, this is the first meeting, in fact, now the third, the third time we have this, that combines all three in a synergistic way uh, by which we can really tackle synergies between brain, mind, body. And, and this is not something that, that um, um, I don't want to hype this. Uh, we all know that I guess if we have a grumpy day, <laughs> right? So we were, when we're unhappy or, or right, so that we're down, our body will feel bad, sure, and, and, and everything goes bad. So health goes bad, body health goes bad if the mind is, is not in a great state, and vice versa. We all get grumpy too when we're, we're unhealthy, right? So it's kind of obvious, but there's so many interactions uh, um, that are not modeled. Um, and, and so here at this conference, we aim to, to make progress in that field. Also using technology that are less obtrusive, and more embracing the natural 
defenses, the natural healing powers of our body and, and our brain. So nudging the brain, nudging the body to heal itself as opposed to uh, supplant or, or um, um, replace function. Right? So that, that's a general setting that we have here. Um, and um, so without further ado, so we have a great program. Um, so this is now the third uh, meeting. So the first meeting was all in person here. The second meeting was all online, virtual. So now we have a hybrid meeting. And so we have, um, um, well, we have probably hundreds of people uh, online. I'm not sure how many show up at 8 a.m. in the morning. Um, and I should just, uh, is everything clear on the other side of Zoom? Can you hear us all? And feel free to, um, anyone on the other side of Zoom, just uh, speak up if you want to hear if the sound is coming through. That sounds Looks great. great, Kurt. Thank you. Oh, great. Masood, good seeing you. <laughs> great. Good seeing you, By too. the way, Masood is, is all the way in, in Lebanon. Uh, he joined us today. What time is there now, uh, Masood? It's, uh, it's 6.20 p.m. Okay, that's not too bad. That's good. Okay, so yes, we have international, um, uh, right? Um, uh, this is a great thing about uh, hybrid meetings, right? We can all uh, connect across the world. Okay, so good. So we're, um, and can you also see the screen well? Yes, looks great. Okay, good. All right. Okay, so um, so first of all, the um, the lectures and the posters are in this room. So are then the spotlights, which will be before the posters. And tomorrow we also have spotlights for the demos. And the demos tomorrow will be in the Mobi lab. So that's uh, that will be up here, right? So that's in the, uh, I'm sure if you can see it. There we go, that's my mouse. Right, so the Mobi lab is, is um, just across um, basically the, the auditorium um, and you can just walk in and, and so we'll have the demos up there tomorrow uh, during the lunch, extended lunch hour. Um, and that's it. So if you want to visit INC, INC is, is on the B1 levels of the stairs. Um, and so the Schwarzman for Computational Earth Science is also here just uh, across. And so the mobile app is, is a part of the Swartz Center, and that's where you get all the action and for, for the, um, the demos tomorrow. Okay, so, and I think we're ready to get started. So we have this a great program. Uh, we start now with the first um, mini symposium, and that will be taken away by um, our great uh, chair of, of that, that um, symposium, that will be uh, Ricky. Thank you. Okay, so with that, I open up the morning uh, mini symposium on integrated neurotechnologies. We have an incredible lineup of speakers. I'm very excited to see the talks. So let me introduce. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Ricky. Uh, and in a lot of ways, I think uh, where I am, I'm actually really grateful for where I'm in this in this talk position, because in many ways, following up after Carolina, where you saw we saw a lot of these uh, uh, technology development early on in the cycle, where whereas I'm on this other end of the cycle, I'm where uh, integrating systems for use in humans with uh, clinical systems, uh, everything good? Oh, okay. Um, sorry, uh, for clinical use in, in either clinical studies or investigational use in humans. So uh, my work is exclusively in this uh, clinical space, and I thought that it might be useful today to kind of give you some perspective from how the development uh, of brain computer interfacing and neuromodulation uh, tools and, and technologies are being applied and where we're currently still struggling with, really, in, in some ways. Uh, as uh, Ricky kind of mentioned, I was previously um, working at Medtronic, so just a little bit of disclosure, there will be some discussion around some Medtronic research tools. I haven't been working for them long enough where I can ensure that there's no conflict of interest, but uh, of course being uh, fl in fully disclosure. Um, and today's agenda really is kind of looking at some of this uh, ongoing development in clinical adaptive neuromodulation and, and how some of these challenges are, might impact other related fields like BCI. And I want to start off with those two words, because neuromodulation, brain computer interfacing, they're two words I think that are near and dear to many of our hearts. Uh, and in some ways, you know, I, I think it's always useful to start off with, you know, kind of starting to define the spaces. 
And when I think about neuromodulation, I think about these established therapies that have been in use for very long periods of time, deep brain stimulation, spinal cord stimulation, transcranial magnetic stimulation, uh, VNS. There's a lot of TL, uh, three letter acronyms that we can use here to kind of describe ongoing kind of chronic implanted uh, neuromodulation. And traditionally these are all stimulation devices, not too unlike the cardiac pacemakers of, of uh, in their current use. Whereas brain computer interfaces, we have a lot of really great clinical demonstrations that include robotic limb control, cursor control, spelling. Of course, we've seen, I, I'm sure a lot of us have seen these really exciting results coming from the brain gate uh, group where there's these chronic long-term single cell electrodes uh, being used to basically do these really exciting applications. And these are traditionally sensing devices, of course. Now, what's really important to consider though, is as we're kind of, you know, continuing to develop these spaces, these traditional kind of definitions are starting to really break down. Neuromodulation is more than stimulation these days. There's of course the Neuropace RNS, a commercial device out there, which senses brain activity to, base, to respond with stimulation in real time to uh, reduce seizures. This is a commercial uh, FDA approved device on the market today. And then there's this growing field of adaptive deep brain stimulation work where deep brain stimulation devices with embedded sensing and algorithm uh, capabilities are now being used and tested out in clinical studies across the, across the country um, to basically use symptomatic biomarkers and to, to respond with stimulation in real time to adjust, uh, to keep patients in healthy non-pathological states. Correspondingly, BCI is also more than just sensing. Motor tasks in, in native, uh, native use of how we interact with the world, you have a, a plethora of different sensory inter, uh, uh, integrations from stretch receptors to temperature to, to pressure that are all being integrated into these motor actions that we are trying to replace with many of the common applications of BCI for those who have suffered from paralysis or, or limb loss. And, uh, of course, even in the sort of tasks that we kind of traditionally think of BCI, sensory feedback in the form of visual feedback is, of course, crucial for any kind of volitional control of a device. People have to see or feel what it is that they're trying to control in order to actually kind of have dexterous <laughs> control. And this sensory feedback has long been proposed as a means of improving BCI, and there's been demonstrations using basically sensory cortical stimulation to basically evoking percepts. Uh, using these for various object discrimination tasks and a lot of talk around future bi-directional BCI applications. So with this in mind, basically, there's this, this growing blurring boundary between what is neuromodulation and, and, and brain-computer interfacing to the point where we've already had studies, and this is one of the studies that I was a part of that you know. Uh, I will note that there will be a variety of work from a large group of people that I'm kind of reviewing today. A lot of it's work that I was not involved in, some of it's work I was involved in. This is work I was involved in. Um, where effectively you're using cortical electrodes placed over the motor cortex using motor intention signals, which are very commonly used in BCI applications, beta band desynchronization, looking for gamma uh, excite, uh, excitation, um, to control the neuromodulation to, uh, received by the patient to treat an essential tremor's sympt uh, patient's symptoms. And this actually worked really well. I don't have time to go through all of the, uh, the, the nuances of these, this big nasty graph I'm plotting ahead of you. But needless to say, when no stimulation is delivered, patient tremors, that's all this garbage here. Uh, when, pick, when their patient's open loop stim, uh, they have no tremor because the neuromodulation works. But then under this closed loop BCI control paradigm, using the motor intention, you have this period of, of transitory tremor primarily due to the latencies and the lags with transmitting data to a PC for processing, as Carolina was already saying, is a big problem in the BCI uh, community to basically solve these days to basically uh, treat this term. So my, one of the things that I kind of try to chew on is what is this distinction between what we consider BCI and neuromod? And I kind of, I kind of, the only way I've kind of come down to it is thinking about it in terms of intent. And it's a bit of a stretch, so stick with me. But clearly BCI, is all about translating user intent into actions, right? User intent in, in some sort of volitional control of a device. Whereas neuromodulation are devices designed with intent, and this is where the stretch, to basically uh, regulate neural circuits and, and, and basically have reduced pathology in the brain. And so the important thing I wanna make here is that these are not mutually exclusive uh, uh, systems. Um, and that the, the overlap between neuromodulation and BCI, I think is gonna to continue to grow. 
So why is my talk focusing on neuromodulation challenges and not just neural interfacing challenges overall? Well, neuromodulation in, is significantly farther down the pipeline in terms of actual application. We're talking about therapies that have established markets, have established regulatory, uh, uh, basically predicate systems. Do we have a large number of pa uh, population of patients already implanted with these systems? And ultimately, they still have the same fundamental technologies, really, when you get down into it. And so the translational challenges that we're looking at in this, uh, as neuromodulation turns into these more BCI-driven sort of uh, applications or closed-loop applications, these are in many ways uh, probably useful context for the wider community to think about in terms of neural interfacing uh, challenges uh, that are likely going to be applicable, regardless of whether the field is in neuromod or BCI. And that these robots, probably some of them will need to be kind of commonly addressed by the, the communities involved in this work. So what are some of these challenges? And my first one I wanna highlight is the challenge of increasing system complexity. And what I mean by that is in neuromodulation, every single patient who's implanted has to have their device programmed by a clinician. And basically the problem is, is that every single patient has a unique anatomy. They have unique uh, ele electro placement. Uh, they have unique uh, responses to simulation. Sometimes there's side effects. Um, also, of course, that these are time varying disorders. So even responses to simulation can change, very, uh, be highly variable over a course of a day. And so clinicians have to manually program each device uh, by, by empirically testing out different simulation parameter combinations while working with their patients to see what works. And because a lot of the diseases that are treated by deep, deep brain stimulation are progressive, they have to come back and do that at fair, on a fairly regular basis. Furthermore, we're starting to see that, so basically what I'm trying to get at is evaluating all these parameters takes real time. And ultimately, you know, the, the parameters that we're talking about, even when in a very limited set, are kind of can re be reduced to most importantly, the pulse amplitude, the pulse width, the frequency, and the electrode contacts, though the number of electrode contacts are also growing uh, just kind of with the, the advent of directional electrodes. Um, that this is basically that even amongst these kind of four segmented, uh, I'm not trying to make a segmented lead joke here, these four small sets of parameters, um, it takes a lot of time for a clinician to figure out what works for this patient. And sometimes it's even more complicated, which we might hear from Helen Mayberg uh, in, in her talk, because the parameter impact on patients isn't actually always instantaneous. Sometimes it actually takes a long period of time before you can actually tell if a patient's doing well uh, based on your chosen parameters. Now, the bad news is that with adaptive deep brain simulation systems, this is only going to get worse. Basically, I, this, is the, this here is a block diagram. Sorry, I'm talking straight into the microphone of the Summit RC plus S embedded algorithm uh, processing chain. Everything from sensing to classification of neural uh, features to then an adaptive algorithm state, state table. There are, I haven't actually done the calculation, but there's at least 10 to 20 times as many parameters here that are relevant and need to be tuned for patients in order for this, this system to work. And this is the hard part with a lot of the adaptive deep brain stimulation studies right now is it requires multiple PhD students in, in these labs doing these studies who are dedicated solely to basically making these systems work with an individual patient. And so the hard part is thinking in terms of the long-term translational plan to market for adaptive deep brain stimulation, how do we make this something that the clinician in their very limited amount of time, because these are very highly paid people in the, in the hospital system that's always already in the United States, very overpriced. How do we get this to be something that they can actually now program in their established workflow? <laughs> and I, I, I posit that we can't, uh, not, not if we're gonna basically follow the previous methods of empirical testing of parameters and seeing if it works. So clearly the need here is for some sort of automated parameter optimization. Uh, and this is the, this is some uh, this is uh, some work that um, I've been engaged in with uh, actually in Emory. There's been some some success in trying to basically try to do this for open loop, where again we're just trying to do this in this limited parameter set uh, of basically stimulation contact and amplitudes and frequencies. Um, but really, the key problem with this is we don't really have good models of the way that the 
neural, that the brain responds to simulation. So predicting the response to simulation is difficult. So it's a lot of ways, the work that's gone on so far is more like automated exploration of stimulation space as opposed to something really data driven that can really kind of make a prediction on what will work for a patient. And this is where the system is still kind of, there's a really big opportunity in this area for basically something to where we can actually do a more predictive approach and not just try to be making the empirical testing go faster. Challenge number two, research system flexibility. Um, and this is where in, in this space, all of this work has been really enabled in, the, in this chronic human space by adaptive deep brain simulation research systems. Notable, uh, uh, the big really notable workhorses in this space were of course the Medtronic Activa PC plus S and the Medtronic Summit RC plus S, which I was fortunate to work on while I was at Medtronic. Um, it's important to note though that both these systems are now unavailable for research use. Um, the Summit RC plus S was just recently sunsetted. Um, so neither of these systems can currently be, are, are being implanted in any patients today. The patients who are implanted with both these systems are now the only patients that will ever be implanted with them. Um, and these are the two systems that really provide a lot of the tools for doing this embedded closed loop types of research. Now there is some, there are some devices out there with sensing and research functionality built in but not really allowing the sort of adaptive stimulation work that we were working on in the past. There's the notable Medtronic Percept PC plus S, which provides clinicians an ability to sense uh, from the implanted electrodes. Sadly though, there is no opening up of adaptive stimulation currently in that system. We also have, of course, the Neuropace RNS that I already mentioned does to provide sensing and uh, adapt and basically responsive stimulation. There's of course, a couple sites around the United States who are engaged in using that system to do sensing research. Um, and then there's, in the UK, there's the bioinduction PicoStim, which there's been a couple papers out, it's, it's fairly new. Um, but really in a lot of ways, you know, it's, it's, we're in a lull right now between uh, the adaptive simulation workhorses of yesterday. Um, and we don't really have an adaptive simulation workhorse of today, though there are some potential really exciting systems on the, on, on the horizon. Notably, the cortex brain interchange, which was already uh, mentioned early in Carolina's speech. Uh, and then there's also a, a, a company called Neuronica in Italy who's working on an alpha DBS system. It's, but you know, these systems are on the horizon. Uh, Cortec has uh, basically worked on software APIs. Neuronica, we're still trying to figure out what they're going to do. So in some ways, there's just simple research tool availability problem here. Um, but kind of moving beyond that, one of the things is that when you actually do get the tool, you of course then have to work with it in, in some sort of way to enable your research, right? And this is where we have a lot of the work has been done in this PC in the loop, not too dissimilar to what a lot of the BCI research has been doing, right? You stream data off the device, you do a lot of complicated processing, and then you then you decide what your simulation update is going to be, and you send it back as quick as you can. Um, but the problem is, of course, is from an engineering perspective and a design a uh, resources perspective, the manufacturers can't provide libraries for all every single language. And these are the three kind of systems for the adaptive neuromodulation kind of space that I kind of talked about that have research APIs that we more or less know about. Um, there's a two prior systems, the Activa PC plus S, the Summit RC plus S, all for Medtronic, and then there's the upcoming brain interchange device. And you'll notice that when you look at the programming language, there is a, there's zero overlap. Um, what that, sh th that means is that there is no opportunity for leveraging past code or past processing methods in, in working with these different devices. Every single time we're getting a new device, we're having to build the ground up from scratch each time. Um, and because these code, these code, this code doesn't trans tr transfer from one platform for another. And at some point, we're going to need to start doing replication studies with other devices. And this is going to be, an, uh, th this is going to be a problem. So there's some work, you know, in, in terms of addressing the system challenge of, well, how do we move past these DLLs and these, and these libraries and provide some cross-programming language support? There's been some work that I've been engaged in with the open mind community about leveraging uh, non, basically different types of uh, software a a API design, such as microservices, where we're leveraging uh, industrial standard uh, protocols like gRPC, um, which will provide some interesting benefits also from an engineering perspective, about how we can sandbox interfacing code from user code application crashes, because I can tell you as, a, as the designer for the Summit API system, the user code will always crash, um, at least at some point when you don't want it in the middle of an experiment. Um, 
And, and you know, we do our best to make sure that the, the medical device interfacing code also doesn't crash. But so, so there is a, there's a lot of work we can do as engineers to make the software APIs more flexible, even if this is kind of an ongoing uh, development space. The other kind of area that we really need some more flexibility around is stimulation artifact. These amplifiers, of course, used in these neural stimulators systems have to record from really, really small signals uh, from, from <coughs> basically generated by neurons and local field potentials. And stimulation is very, very big. So we have a really, we have the worst case scenario from in terms of how we can record this data. And we've, in the neuromodulation space, we've kind of, I'm going to say we kind of cheated a little bit where we can basically, we've been using electrode geometry, where we're basically stimulating in the middle of two differential signals, uh, where we do a differential measurement around the simulation electrode to take advantage of common mode. Um, the problem is, is that when you're getting into a lot of actual neurophysiology, you're now doing a differential measurement. What happens if beta rises at both of those electrodes in phase? Gee, that's something from electrophysiology standpoint we care about, but because we're basically, it's common mode, we don't see it. And so there's basically, the problem is that relying on electrogeometry to save us from stimulation artifact, it's too inflexible. It's a crutch, to be frank. And basically we need better stim rejection circuits, circuitry here uh, for, for basically long-term clinical translation. The other kind of challenge, the final challenge in this flexibility kind of theme here is that in so far in the systems that we've worked with that have embedded, embedded functionality for embedded algorithms that we can send patients home with to actually try out is that these systems are really resource constrained and they provide one signal processing pipeline. And one signal processing pipeline designed in this case with the summit system, I'll tell you, this is designed for the Parkinsonian case, has a lot of limitations when you start working outside of what the design constraints, what the design inputs were for that, for that system input. And as a generic research tool, there's a lot of basically making round holes fit into, square pegs fit into round holes when you start working with just one basically relatively inflexible embedded embodiment of an algorithm when you actually want to have an open-ended research tool. So there, we basically, in some ways, I want to either, I want to find out if there's ways that we can, as a community, start supporting more generic, uh, either with through, uh, you know, having more open-ended, um, basically regulatory, like program, pro programming of these devices, or if there's ways that we can basically make them much more flexible by having more components and, and more configurable sensing change. That's something that we need moving forward. So finally, the last, the, the, the last challenge I want to highlight today is getting out of the clinic. Most adaptive deep brain stimulation studies to date have all been in controlled environments, right? You bring the patient in, they get, they, they, you hook them up to your reporting system, any extra hardware that you want to have, and then you basically, you, you run them through a gauntlet of tasks, and then in, and, and you collect your data and you publish it. Um, the, prop, the hard part, though, is that these are time-varying symptoms not just in terms of time as in circadian effects, so those are real, um, but it's also, it depends on the context. These are, these are really complicated disorders, especially when you start looking at where neuromodulation is being kind of really investigated in now in more and more in the mental health space as well, not just the movement disorder space. Um, these are complicated disorders where basically there's a big question I think a lot of us are having is, does the in-clinic experience and performance of these embedded systems translate to real day-to-day -day life, right? And is, are we capturing everything that we should be capturing in the clinic? Um, and so this is where we really need to start shifting our data collection opportunities out of the clinic and back into patients' real life to basically build out tools that can capture um, more kind of complete pictures of how these systems are interacting with patients as they go about their daily, daily living. And that's, of course, there's a lot of kind of safety questions, privacy data privacy questions, and also kind of efficacy questions that go along with that. Now, the, the exciting, I mean, it's, I'm not going to say this is exciting, but one, the one unenable, uh, un kind of negotiable fact is that COVID-19 has changed a lot of the, like, the, the, the groundwork in this space. It required the expansion of remote research um, and to basically keep clinical studies going. That were, that were underway because patients were in the middle 
of, of basically a of, of, a, of a clinical care pipeline where the device is required <laughs> to keep on working with their devices while they weren't able to come into the hospital. And one kind of uh, big, you know, kind of really great work that came out of the UCSF team led by Phil Starr was that they, they deployed their streaming platform for the Summit RC Plus S to patients' homes. And they were now suddenly able to collect for months at a time, daily recordings, you know, creating an amazing data set. Um, now, the problem with what, the, what, with what this has done is the use of at-home recording wasn't ever really considered as a design input on the summit development side. I can tell you that as someone who's on that team. There are in the spectrum alone six devices that require, you know, sometimes daily recharging by the patient. This is a real patient burden because we basically, the, the patient's always having to manage these devices. And sometimes they literally ha have had uh, talked about um, basically the amount of the amount of just constant anxiety around where are all my batteries at? because I already have enough anxiety around my one cell phone in my pocket, what its batteries at. I don't have to worry about the implanted batteries, the communication batteries, the, you know, any of my wearable sensor batteries. It's, it's, it's a, it's, there's a lot of basically work that we can do to improve this type of at-home data collection for these types of patients. Even more kind of ambitious was there was a, there's a Mayo team effort by, uh, led by Greg Borrell, where they didn't just deploy an at-home sensing system. They deployed an at-home PC in the loop distributed stimulation platform for therapy. And this is where basically it was the, the PC is, is instrumental in the real-time an analysis of uh, neural data for basically adjusting therapy in real time. And in epilepsy, this is a high-risk population where if you do the wrong thing at the wrong time, you could cause some really, you could cause some really serious effects for these patients. So this required extensive. I'm using the QMS here. That's quality management system from a medical device system. This required an extensive academic quality management system effort to basically completely verify and validate in a medical design controls context, this system before they could deploy it. And it was lifting a mountain for these guys and they did really good work. And I'm, I'm happy to kind of highlight the work that they did here. Now, the final kind of remote data collection challenge, you know, some of these things, there's, so, there's some good predicate work showing that we can make, there's, these are hits to overcome, but something that we can be doing better is that when we are deploying these multimodal sensing approaches, we have to synchronize the data. Otherwise, you know, at some point you're not, you're not gonna have the data set. You're just gonna have, you know, several parallel collected data streams and you're not gonna know what happened where. And really the thing is, is that, um, the problem is, is each device clearly has its own clock, which has their own clock to make, which is then time sampling, it's sampling, it's sampling that, that for its logging of data at its own rate. Um, and the, even the timestamps on the same device, especially if you've ever done some, any work with time stamping on Windows, can be already highly variable. Um, and so the gold standard today is to create basically multimodal artifacts. And this is again, work out of a Mayo group. Um, where uh, basically you create a common artifact and then basically, and then you, you align data manually. We need something better than this, I think. Okay, so wrapping up, basically, I think the distinctions between Nermod and BCI are becoming increasingly relevant because the technology uh, pipeline is, is, is relies on the same components. And like really while we're at this workshop together, I think one of the big opportunities we have is to chew on these translational challenges. You know, how will these technologies be used by people who are actually managing the deployment, the clinicians that are on the field? How will we architect the next generation of devices and how can we keep on collecting gold standard uh, data? Okay, with that, I'd like to thank you all for your time. Uh, and there's a lot of people that goes into this work that I don't have time for them all, but really appreciate the opportunity to present to you all today. I thank you for your presentation. I agree with you that uh, providing data for an API is a way to use the system. And uh, we are facing that uh, in different it's, uh, cross platform, different languages. Which, in your opinion, it will be the, the platform and the language that for APIs and to be in the future it will be Python, C? I, this is where I actually more? I actually think there's a lot of value to be had in some of these cross uh, cross language supported systems like gRPC that I mentioned, which actually through a defined protobuf file allows you to interface with programming language specific tools to basically 
program as if it was a DLL written that specific language, but you're actually interfacing with a discrete component with its own instance. Uh, I think that's actually the way that, that's where I'm currently leaning. Um, and in part, that's a really easy way for me to sidestep on which programming language is best argument. Okay, thank you. Thank you again. Let's thank, let's thank Jeffrey. <laughs> Professor Gerald Yu. Gerald is an associate professor of electrical and computer engineering at the N1 Institute for Health at the National University of Singapore. Dr. Yu received his BS, MS, and PhD degrees in the Department of Electrical Engineering from the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology, KAIST, in Daejeon, Korea. From 2010 to 2016, he was with the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science, Mazdar Institute, Abu Dhabi, United Arab Emirates, where he was an associate professor. From 2010 to 2011, he was always also with the Microsystems Technology Laboratories, MTL, at MIT as a visiting scholar. He has pioneered research on body area network transceivers for communication powering and wearable body sensor networks using the planar fashionable circuit board for, for a continuous health monitoring system. He continued research um, his current research interests include low energy circuit technology for wearable biosignal sensors, flexible circuit board platforms, body area networks for communication and powering, ASICs for piezoelectric micro machined ultrasound transducers, and system on chip design to system realization for wearable healthcare applications. Well, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for a nice introduction. Is the microphone on? Hmm. Oh, yeah. Oops, sorry. <laughs> All right. All right. Okay, so I'll, I'll be talking about the wearables today, um, which is complementing the technologies we have in hearing today. And is it better now? Yeah. All right, good. And I'll be also emphasizing on the pervasiveness because however good technology you may have, if the patient doesn't use it, it's going to be uh, less work. And that's a very important aspect as well. And I'll be talking about an example with the seizure and epilepsy of the chronic conditions. And I can tell you that many of the chronic conditions have similar symptoms. But anyways, uh, as you might already know, the prevalence of epilepsy is around 2 million in the US, it's about 70 million worldwide, it's quite serious. And detecting it earlier and prior to uh, clinical onset is very important for intervention, hopefully with the DBS or drug release. And if you look at the surface EEG perspective, a lot of cases, one of the difficulties is that it's not always like that, but a lot of cases, you can see that from the electrical onset happens prior to clinical onset. And that the lead time is around, I'll say from patient to patient, it's different, but two seconds, sometimes even up to like a minute before the clinical onset. So if you can actually detect that from the surface EEG, preferably, then you have chance to actually intervene before the clinical onset hits. But the problem with this, the current um, seizure detection technologies, if you look at how the clinics are um, handling this these days, we still rely heavily on asking the patient, how many seizures did you have? The, the patient asking the patient. And they, based on the answer, sometimes the patients are intermitted, I mean, admitted to hospital, and hoping overnight EEG recording will capture the seizure event. The problem with that is not always, and oftentimes that overnight monitoring over 24 hours doesn't capture the seizure because it's not always as, I mean, you, you can never guarantee when the seizure will strike. All right, so that's the problem. Now, so what's the solution here? We can try to make it wearable. Um, EEG and wearable are not always going along that well. That's why the research is needed here. But for EKG, for example, it's quite uh, relatively easier compared to EEG, but that's where the effort has to be done. So now we have to make it always on body and we're on a flexible platform. And that why we need a flexible platform is to make it pervasive. And I told you why it's pervasiveness is important is because if it's really bulky and the patient feels it difficult to use, then, you know, you're doomed. 
especially if you're going to monitor it for days or weeks, you must make sure that it's pervasive enough. And for the electrical point of view, um, electronics point of view, that's a disaster. The flexible platform is because it's bearing so much, we have to deal with many different conditions. Now, okay, just to give you some background on uh, the healthcare here. Oh, before we move forward that, I just skip one slide there. Okay, the market is also very big. Um, I'll say untapped market is there. It's about 34 billion by 2026, but I think it'll be even larger in these days that we are um, planning on, I mean, uh, looking forward. And sensing and processing and powering are all the aspects we have to deal with. And I'll be also uh, hopefully have time to touch the powering aspect. The previous speaker, as well as the next speaker, will be talking about powering as well, which is very important aspect <laughs> of making pervasive wearable healthcare. Now, for some reason, the uh, laptop is a sluggish. But anyways, now you might be asking, uh, if you're going to talk about the healthcare and processing with the wearables, why don't you just capture the signal stream to your smartphones or your laptop and process there. Now that works perfectly fine if you're going to monitor it for about a couple of hours, for, for example. And the reason being that is the radio power actually dominates. Whenever you're gonna process and stream it, even if you're using Bluetooth low energy, for example, the processing power will not be dominating. It'll be the radio power which dominates, which gives us an uh, gives to some, I'll say, motivation. Why do you need to make it, uh, SOC, we call a system on chip, make sure that the processing and the closing the loop also is done on chip. I'll give you an example here. For example, if you make a fully on chip versus wireless EEG, meaning that you capture the EEG from your sensor and then stream it to the cell phone or whatever you have, the power, amount of power you'll be consuming is like two orders of magnitude higher. That's why system on chip with the uh, silicon is very, very important, especially when it comes to wearable. Okay, with that, I'll be splitting the talk into four parts. Normally, I, I talk about one hour for each, but today I sprint, squeeze it down to less than 20 minutes. But anyways, platform is one of them, making it flexible. Second is when you have a flexible platform, the sensor interface circuit has a lot of things to do. Third is about digital backend. That's the core part of it, how you process it and then make it on-chip classification of seizure and epilepsy detection. And uh, I know that a lot of you, some audience here are experts in this domain as well. And lastly, the powering aspect. Okay, uh, for the platform, I just have one slide. Um, for EKG, we have been working with the textile platform to make it as a patch foam factor. And EG, uh, for the EKG, we can even make the electrode to be a uh, dry electrode out of the super paste uh, screen printed on the uh, textile. For EG, unfortunately, that doesn't work. We still have to rely on the textile platform with the integrated circuit. However, the electrode has to be still the gel electrode that sticks, uh, sticks to your skull. But anyways, the motto here is to, instead of making the electronics flexible, let's start from flex something that's already flexible. And that's one of the uh, motto we had is to make sure it's pervasive enough so that the wearer doesn't have a foreign object feeling about it. Well, that on that aspect, the circuit has to do diligence. Well, I skipped every many, many parts there, but anyways, because the uh, textile is not an ideal platform for the electronics, we have many problems per se. But before even if we go to that domain, we also have to deal with uh, many challenges as a circuit point, circuit perspective when it comes to biopotential signal monitoring. So you might be asking, we are in the um, era of terahertz, and what, what's the big deal of amplifying signals that's below one kilohertz? But unfortunately, what happens to this is that the signal bandwidth of many physiologic signals lie within the intruders, I say. For example, the 60 hertz in the US, in Singapore, it's 50 hertz interference coming in, as well as one of F noise, and also the motion artifact. The motion artifact is when you have the wearables and the electrode is swinging around and swaying around, that will result in a lot of intrusion in the signal electrode. And, and by the way, part of that is due to the fact that the heavy batteries on a patch is making the electrode swing on top of floating on the skin as well. And that's another motivation why I want to get rid of the battery on the wearables. Anyways, um, for that, uh, I'll just uh, skip that part. For the uh, electric 
I mean, circuit perspective, I have already mentioned to you of many problems there. But one of the challenges when it comes to EEG is that the signal itself is very, very small from the surface EEG point of view. Well, a lot of these problems will be, um, I would say, mitigated if you use the intracranial EEG, but that's out of scope for today's talk because we want to focus on the wearable. And we also have the uh, CMLR problem, the common mode rejection, because of the interference, especially the 60 hertz I'll be talking about in the next slide, as well as uh, many different challenges, such as the high electrode impedance that when it comes to the surface EG electrode. Now, again, so uh, for the circuit techniques, I'm not going to deep dive into this because the audience is not in the circuit. Most of you are not in the circuit, but we can tell you that chopping multi-channel sharing ICs and low noise dynamic offset cancellations can mitigate many of these features, I mean, uh, problems. Now, I talked to you about the seriousness of the 60 hertz, 50 hertz interference. I will be talking about that in particular. So this is me in my lab, and I will be replicating the wearable environment by having the floating ground, meaning that the ground electrode will be floating, um, grabbing the uh, oscilloscope screen, and you'll be seeing that nice sine wave coming in. The amplitude is about seven volt peak to peak. And we are talking about the EEG signal that's in the microvolt region. And the common mode that couples into your body is about seven volt peak to peak. So that's why you have to suppress that well. And in a clinical setting, you don't see this problem because you have a driven right leg, which means that the common mode will be also driving your uh, body so that your body has no problem differentiating from this. But the wearables, especially if you're talking about true electro system, you have to deal with this. That's the problem we're facing, sorry. Now, this amount of uh, common mode interference is so serious that it can even actually harvest power of it, which I'll be talking very briefly how to, uh, later on. But uh, suppressing this is a big topic, big problem. Now, I'll move on to the uh, digital backend of the patient-specific classification and energy efficiency. Now, uh, when it comes to seizure detection, you might be asking, what's the big deal from the surface EG? Wouldn't the EG signal will have a high energy when the seizure strikes? And if you just do the binary classification, that's it. Or that's the same mistake I made when I first started this research 13 years ago. So when I first saw it, so let's look at the uh, patient on the left. You can see that as our stereotypical um, uh, thoughts about it. You can see that the EEG comes very uh, relatively higher energy relative to the uh, normal pattern. But look at the patient on the right. You can see that when the seizure strikes, the surface EEG pattern becomes relatively quieter. And you can see that the hardware is not good at classifying different things. Hardware is good at accelerating repeated patterns. So that's the issue we have. And we call it patient-to-patient age -patient variations. The next thing is the intra-patient age-to-age variations. So I hope that was not the only story, but even within the patient, as the patient ages, the pattern may shift. So this means that you also have to adapt to this different pattern change in seizure. I'm also talking I'm particularly talking about this in the surface EG perspective. Okay, spatial EG variation means depending on the seizure pattern, if it is focal seizure or generalized case, you might be observing the seizure pattern from different channels. And this means that you have to have a multi-channel monitoring as well. Now, if I were to uh, summarize the aspect that we have to focus on when it comes to seizure detection on chip, that energy efficiency is the key, of course, because you have limited battery life, or sometimes you want to deliver the power remotely, and you want to sustain at least three to five days monitoring. And form factor, you need to make it as small as possible because of the, um, the pervasiveness I already emphasized a lot. And it means that we have to integrate the in instrumentation amplifier, or IA, with the classification and data storage at the same time. And latency is also the key that you must detect prior to clinical onset. This is from the surface EG. That means that the latency has to be less than two seconds, preferably. And one of the aspects we have to think about when it comes to patient-specific training is that you have really have limited training sets. So you, let's say you have a new patient admitted to hospital. <coughs> you cannot expect you have like 1 million seizure pattern from that patient. You can probably hope for that having capturing one episode during the hospital admittance. And that means out of that one episode, you have to, oh, sorry, you have to get many uh, data, as many data as possible, which is not much in the perspective of a neural network, for example. 
So uh, before I go even further, let me define my terminologies in uh, this, this presentation today. So in the domain of the machine learning and artificial intelligence, there's machine learning. And within the machine learning, I would say there's a class bars that are traditional, falls into traditional ML machine learning, which includes the SVM, decision trees, nearest neighbor, and et cetera. And there's also neural network, which is uh, very popular these days, like CNN, DNN, and et cetera. All right. And when it comes to seizure detection, you cannot say by default, neural network is the best option. It's not always like that. It really depends on what application you're looking into. Well, what do I mean? What do I mean by that? So let's look at the latency versus the available training sets. For example, if you're looking at the big data analysis, like a medical image analysis, like lung cancer out of the CTs or, or X-rays, this is a classic example where deep learning is the perfect fit. You don't have to worry about the latency that much. Your goal is to have the highest accuracy as possible, and you have you do have tons of uh, training sets. Self-driving cars is another example where you have tons of examples, um, training sets. Here, the latency is an issue. You need to make sure that det detection is done within the 30 millisecond or less. And when it comes to wearable healthcare, you have the latency issue. You need to make sure the latency is no, lower, no longer than two seconds, preferably. And another problem is that you don't have that much training sets per patient, right? I emphasize again. Now, so with that, I can classify the research in the seizure detection in two uh, large sets, which are both important. First is the real-time onset detection, where we are targeting in this talk. So we want to make a patient specific so that each patient pattern that differs are captured. Latency has to be within two seconds. And the goal here is to have a good accuracy. If you want perfect accuracy, you should go for intracranial EEG, and then probably you should also go for deep learning later on for that specific patient. But here is to intervene the potential seizure episode in clinical onset before the clinical onset you detected. So for that, with the limited training sets, machine learning may work better. Whereas the prediction and the post-analysis, it's another important part of research. It's patient non-specific and latency is not an <coughs> issue here. Oh, sorry. Latency is not a big issue here and you need to have highest possible accuracy. Here, probably D DNN or deep learning is the best option. Now, uh, I can also tell you, so for example, arrhythmia and diabetes are classic examples where you can, you, can be, you can generalize the cases. So that needs deep learning or neural network is the best option there. Whereas the seizure and epilepsy for surface EEG with the patient specific, probably you might want to look into traditional machine learning because of the limited data sets. Now, um, a lot of you from coming from the medical field or clinics, of course, by default, you know what, what I'm talking about here with the sensitivity and specificity, but some engineers, especially if you're uh, focusing on the um, machine learning, you might have been only focusing on accuracy. But of course, when it comes to clinical settings, both sensitivity and specificity is very, very important. And when it comes to the sensitivity, we are basically trying to say how many seizures out of the actual seizure cases are you detecting? Whereas the specificity is that when you have normal pattern, how well you're detecting normal pattern out of the actual normal patterns. I mean, how many normal patterns are you successfully classifying? Both are very, very important, right? So then we have to target sensitivity and specificity at the same time. Now for that, we can have the linear SVM, for example, with the limited training set, whereby the boundary between seizure and non-seizure is linear boundaries. Whereas the non-linear SVM, the boundary between the seizure and non-seizure cases can be carved away with the nonlinear boundary. And you can already feel that nonlinear SVM will be more accurate. And it is the case. Now, one pitfall here is that nonlinear SVM actually requires more seizure patterns to train accurately the boundary. And we don't have that many, many training sets. That's a problem. Now, uh, if you are to classify it, you can divide the spectral uh, spectrum, EEG spectrum into, uh, I'm talking about surface EEG, into spectral variations of little spatial variations up to 16 to 20 channels and temporal variation, you accumulate around two seconds. This is just one way of doing it actually, but I would say this works fairly well for uh, patient specific detection cases. Okay. Now, uh, when it comes to linear SVM, we, we can see that it achieves around 80 per, 87% or 85% in, in the um, sensitivity. 
but the false positive rate is around uh, on average around five to six percent, which is not good enough, I would say. And when it comes to non-linear SVM, it works fairly well. You can see now the sensitivity is now 95% and the false positive is suppressed well as well. But as I said, this works when the clinical, I mean, this works only if you have trained with the sufficient training sets, right? So up to here, you might see, you might be feeling, okay, non-linear SVM seems the best option. But the problem I have been emphasizing over and over again is that when the new, new patient comes in, you don't have that training set. That's the problem. And with the limited training sets, we have found that actually non-linear SVM performs poorly, right? And same problem with the neural network. With the limited training sets, you are really doomed. So uh, one, one way to get around is to use the two linear SVMs, one targeted and trained for the sensitivity and the other one just trained for this specificity. Of course, then what it happens is that you're gonna have two plus fires, one for the sensitivity, the other one for the specificity and then have the arbiter determine. And of course, by doing that, you'll have a lot of time, oftentimes the two detectors are telling the different stories. So what we need to have here is that we call it distal hysteresis. So that once you have gained a sufficient, once you have switched from the seizure to non-seizure, you don't go back easily back to the uh, seizure cases or vice versa. And by doing that, instead of using the one linear SVM, you can see that the uh, dual plus bar performs better. The specificity, we still need to work on it, but anyways, uh, this is acceptable range compared to the single SVM that's better. Now with that, you can combine these and try to close the loop by having the surface EG with the amplifiers, multiple channels. You try to have a dual plus bar to detect seizure on time, real time. And then you can even have the transcranial uh, stimulation. <laughs> of course, the transcranial stimulation from the surface is not going to be as effective, but at least you can close uh, you can trigger, for example, the DBS associated with it, or even the drug release later on. Now, uh, let's see how the how it performs with the benchmark. We uh, in the seizure and epilepsy, we have some uh, database for the IEG. We have the EU database for the surface EG. We have the MIT CHP database, and here we can see that the um, seizure is quite well detected. With, um, uh, for example, this um, patient 15, you can see that with the naked eye. It's very difficult to classify, but the circuit is successfully detecting it. Um, same goes with the other patients here. If I only tell you the good story, probably I'll be lying. I'll be very honest with you. There are cases where uh, it doesn't work that well. For example, this patient six is always a problematic patient. Um, this infant patient, it turns out this patient has more than one seizure patterns. And uh, we uh, finally found a way to get around, but you can see this is a classical example where the sensitivity is good but the specificity is really bad. Okay, um, we also have the local hospital, university hospital patient, we tested it um, in vivo. And you can see that, uh, you can clearly see that the seizure is detected prior to clinical onset or at least around 10, five seconds before. And that's good news that you can deal with it. Now, um, I have been talking about patient specific classification uh, using the traditional uh, class bars, machine learning like this, where you have to pray that once you admit the patient, the seizure will happen during that admitting, I mean, that day. And you can see that that's not always the case. Some patients will have long seizure intervals between seizure, it may prolong for days. That's why uh, when it comes to seizure and epilepsy, you, you, uh, I talk to this uh, physician and clinician sometimes jokes, you release the pediatric patients with the, um, with the, uh, parents and tell them, please monitor carefully the patient for the next one week. And after uh, two or three deprived, sleep deprived nights, parents will have seizure because of the uh, lack of seizure and left of sleep. And that's why another reason why we need to have a pervasive and wearable seizure detection. Now, how do you resolve this? Um, you can have the online tuning classifier to deal with the uh, intrapatient variation, <coughs> but still you have to rely on the seizure um, based on the patient specific. So we can also work on the patient independent classification, whereby you train the pre-trained classifier with the database we already have. But of course, that doesn't resolve the situation where one seizure pattern is a, a normal pattern for the other patient. So patient to patient variation doesn't be, uh, cannot be resolved with this. So what we can do is to have the neural network with the zero shot retaining, meaning that you already pre-trained the, uh, 
the data with the database, you pre-train the classifier. However, you do need to um, do the patient-specific training on the fly for the first two minutes upon uh, using this uh, sensor. And that is done with the neural pattern cluster. Basically what it is, is the k-means clustering after this deep learning is done. So before deploying, you start uh, by monitoring the normal pattern for two minutes, and then that will determine which cluster you're in, which is normal pattern, which is not. Of course, this is not going to be as accurate as the patient specific with the trained, with the uh, specific to that patient. And I'll also disclaim, uh, give you a disclaimer here. The numbers that you are seeing here is not the same sensitivity or specificity. The one that I reported before is event, I mean, so sample by sample variation, which is much more pessimistic estimate, whereas this is the event, event detection, meaning that if you had one seizure out of uh, 100 samples, even if you have detected once, you are 100% accurate for this event-based detection. However, I would say this is good enough for specific settings, especially for patient-independent classification to start off detection with. Okay. I'm running a little bit over time, right? Um, probably I'll be doing very briefly about the uh, powering variables. Okay, maybe I'll just go for five, oh, sorry. So now we come to the wearables. The battery is always a problem. It's insufficient. It's not. Um, it's very large. It works with the uh, motion artifact as well, and inconvenient for charging. Now, as you know, when you have like tens of wearables, charging tracking is really a stress, right? So you have this. Uh, with smartphone is fifty percent. My AirPod is thirty percent. My seizure detector has a thirty percent. That that would be a stress, right? So then people will be thinking about what about we just do for energy harvesting. But the problem with the energy harvesting is that the energy harvesting site is not ideal for the sensor. For example, if you're talking about ECG under the chest covered with the clothing, the PV, the photovoltaic is rolled out, right? So then how do you deal with it? You, can you use the uh, RF harvesting? Well, the bad news is the human body absorbs the RF energy, especially from gigahertz region. So that's not bad, that's not good either. So then we call it body shadowing effect. And, and what we have done is, okay, we can use the human body as a coupling medium instead of human body letting it block in. So it means that if you have one transmitter such as a cell phone or in your pocket or the smart, smart watch, it can potentially provide power to the rest of the wearables. Deficiency is not as good, but as well, I mean, at least it provides some means to provide power to the rest of the wearables. And you can use the same mechanism to collect the power from the 60 Hertz I, I was talking about in the previous slides, you can actually harvest the energy out of it as well. So uh, I'll skip the uh, technical details here, but just give you some example of how it works. This is an example of the calculator powered up by the uh, human body coupling. You can see that the power bank is providing power through the one electrode setting, and you're going to grab it. And you can see that the power bank is transmitting power through the body and then it provides the power to the calculator in the other outside, other side. And we have confirmed that you can actually use the same mechanism to power, let's say, tens of wearables throughout the body. So that can actually potentially um, eliminate the need for the battery for the sensor that you're talking about, especially <coughs> seizure detection. But here, the message I want to give you is that wearable sensor is a good potential for pervasive sensing, especially for epilepsy and seizure detection. And machine learning is a person for key for the personalized healthcare, but that doesn't mean that you can use by default the neural network. You have to use appropriately. And body coupled powering can be used potentially for providing parts of wearable sensors. So for being over time a little bit. <laughs> now Thank I'm over. So much, yeah. Thank you for that compact. There's always much pressure when you say one question. I'll take two. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I want to ask you about the energy harvesting. Um, you know, I'm super interested in this space, obviously. What do you see as the maximum amount of power that you can support? I know some of those things you mentioned are sensors, very low power sensors. Is there kind of a suite of applications you imagine being supported by energy harvesting, a suite of applications that are outside of? Right. I, I think this is an excellent question. Okay, let me get back to you on this. Um, just to answer your question, uh, if you're talking about one end to the other end of the body, entire body, 
uh, the maximum power at the reasonable power consumption of the transmitter. Of course, this is equation of how much path loss you have. But for the reasonable amount of power you can collect with the reasonable TX, which means less than 10 milliwatt in the TX, it's around, I'll say, tens of microwatt, the other end of the body. But if you're going to apply this for the serial detection, probably what you can think of is if you have less distance between, uh, for example, you can have a battery as a necklace format and then transmit power to the seizure detection sensors. That's about 20 centimeters or less. Then you can obviously target milliwatt, no problem of power. But now um, another reason, as I said, to remove battery from the sensor is that you don't want motion artifact. You want to make it as light as possible. That's another reason you might want to remove battery from the sensor itself. But excellent question. <clears throat> Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, one of your slides, you uh, showed that you eventually want to close the loop by having a few yes. now. Yes. So I wonder how far did you get there, and would that be also be covered by by energy harvesting? Oh, um, okay, that's an excellent point. By the way, um, I'll give you an example. The transcranial stimulation is just to show that you can trigger the closing the loop for example, with the DBS, for example, from the surface EEG and surface electrode, stimulation is not as I mean, efficient as you might, as you already know. So I will tell you that probably suppressing seizure is not that easy with the surface electrode, but at least once you have successfully detected seizure, you can trigger the DBS or the drug release if you have that. That, that probably is the conceptual closed link, closed loop that I was talking about, yes. I hope that answers your question. Very well, thanks. Gerald, thank you so much. And let's thank Gerald for coming all the way from Singapore. <laughs> Talks this morning is that they were in completely different clinical domains and applications, but had so many of the same themes <coughs> uh, in terms of what the challenges are in, in neurotechnology from powering to closing the loop computation latency to data management and clinical usability. So it was so interesting to see those themes pop up again and again. So we're gonna take our break. We'll come back in 15, 10 minutes, okay? At um, 10, 20, and there's probably coffee. Coffee water outside here. <laughs> okay. And um, if you have a poster, if you have a poster, uh, please feel free to put your poster up because uh, they just need to today. So, um, like.